Okay, so it is said that history is written by the victors. But in the era of information, we just have to dig out the truth and expose the lies. The Syrian Archive is a group of volunteers dedicated to documenting human rights violations committed by all sides during the Syrian conflict. With over 2,000 incidents preserved and more hours of online footage than there have been hours of conflict, the Syrian Archive is the only tool to gather and verify all this data. Without further ado, I present to you the Syrian Archive team. Thanks. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Hadil Khatib. And I'm Jeff George. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for being here and thank the CCC for inviting us. It's really, uh, we appreciate being able to present here. Uh, what we'll be going through in the next 30 minutes uh, is an overview of the project, the background, uh, specific problems that we have identified while working on user-generated content, uh, our methodology and uh, three case studies, as well as our plans for 2017. So we have started this work uh, in Turkey in 2014, working with journalists, uh, lawyers, and human rights activists. Uh, and the project is about a platform that collects, verifies, uh, preserves, and analyzes visual documentation of human rights violations and the goal is to create an evidence-based tool that can be used for reporting, advocacy, accountability by journalists, human rights defenders, and lawyers. Uh, since then, we have been uh, collaborating with a number of groups, uh, the United Nations or CHR, which is the investigation team based in Geneva doing investigations on Syria since 2012. We've been working with them on investigations related to Aleppo since they got the mandate to do this from the Security Council a few weeks ago. Uh, we've been also working with Human Rights Watch related to cluster munitions research in Syria, Amnesty International as well, with their digital, document digital verification corps team, which is a group of young professionals from Berkeley University and Essex University who are helping us doing in-depth uh, verification. We've been also collaborating with Bellingcat, which is a collective uh, of investigators specialized in the use of uh, open source uh, investigations. Uh, we've been also working with the Medan uh, on integrating their platform, which is a collaborative uh, verification platform. Uh, also with Witness, in terms of improving our methodology and workflow, with Tactical Technology Collective that are supporting us in the development of the collecting infrastructure, as well as, of course, Syrian journalists, lawyers, and human rights defenders, as they are our main source of information, such, such, such as the Syrian Institute for Justice. Uh, so, since the Tunisian Revolution, we have seen a big shift in how conflict has been being uh, reported. Uh, so, from uh, being reported by journalists, NGOs who had access to the country uh, into depending more on user-generated content, especially in areas where you can't actually access the country. Uh, journalists and NGOs are banned from reporting. And in the case of Syria, there are more hours of online footage than there are actually uh, hours in the conflict itself. And hidden in that footage, there is hundreds of untold stories, uh, human rights violations, and possibly uh, war crime evidence. But with this user-generated content that we have been working with, uh, we identified uh, three kind of problems. One of it is the content is being erased and can't be found. Uh, content is not verified. The content is unsearchable. So working with lawyers and human rights activists, uh, they are doing this work in a hostile environment. They have been attacked and targeted by many groups for doing their work. They have been attacked by all kinds of weapons, basically. Uh, their devices get damaged, their data gets lost, the evidence gets lost. Uh, of course, when they are moving uh, through checkpoints, where they are moving through uh, borders, also their devices are seized, damaged, and of course, information is being lost. If they are publishing what they have on social media platform, it's being deleted, it's being removed, it's because it violates the privacy policy of those commercial social media services, uh, and also because their accounts get hacked because of what they are publishing. In this case, Physicians for Human Rights has worked on uh, an investigation and documentation related to attacks against hospitals in Syria, they refer to visual evidence that was published on YouTube. It's not there anymore. Uh, we lost the evidence that actually refers to this type of attack. And I don't know if we can get it again. Uh, it's not just us that are having this problem, but also other investigators, such as 
Uh, Bellingcat, uh, Elliot from Bellingcat, who is the director, has been doing a lot of work on chemical attacks that happened in August uh, 2013. And basically, most of the evidence that he has been looking for uh, and, and analyzing has been also uh, gone. The other problem related to this is that content is basically scattered everywhere. Uh, it's on different social media platforms, different websites. It's really hard to understand what happened in a specific incident because it's really hard to understand the full image. Um, it's also, of course, scattered offline uh, when there's uh, no internet connectivity in external hard drives or computers. When it's published online, it's not verified. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of videos. We are not talking about one or two that are coming every day. Um, with this comes a lot of fake information as well, uh, which makes it really hard for journalists and uh, human rights organizations to actually respond to this huge amount of data related to violations. Uh, it is so difficult uh, for it to be searchable because it doesn't have any kind of metadata when it's published. Um, also, metadata is being stripped from social media platform when uh, visual evidence is published there. Most reports that are published by human rights organizations uh, or articles by journalists are in different formats, PDF formats, so it's really inaccessible. Um, so we worked to address these three problems um, in a variety of ways. Uh, so for the first problem, that content's being deleted or that it's scattered throughout the internet, uh, we work to develop an automated secure content backup tool. Uh, so every day our content is being scraped and backed up um, externally on servers throughout the world. Um, also, by making the platform, um, uh, the database online, available online, we've kind of centralized um, the data that's being scattered throughout the internet and put it in one place. Um, dealing with the fact that the content is not verified, we've worked to develop a very detailed um, methodology. It's an open source methodology. Uh, that we're going to go into in a little bit. Um, and also an infrastructure so that we can uh, highlight how the verification is actually working. And then um, relating to the fact that the content is unsearchable, we um, recognized the fact that we needed to have a very uh, standardized metadata scheme um, and a filter system so that you can search through all the content that we have. So for the methodology, we found three components. Um, there's a collection, the archival component, there's the basic verification component uh, and more in-depth investigations. F so there's five steps that we've identified for collection and archival. The first step before we have any of the content um, is to first make a list of all of our sources uh, for, for that content. Uh, so we have uh, identified 200 credible sources uh, made up of a variety of individuals or organizations, um, you know, local field clinics, individual citizens, and, and larger NGOs. A lot of the sources that we've been working with have been um, reporting on the conflict since 2011 or 2012, uh, although some are more recent. So after we have a list of the sources for the content, we needed to develop a list of sources for the verification. Uh, you can't verify the content with the same sources who are providing the content. Um, so we need to develop a separate list. And this is mostly made up of a team of uh, citizen journalists and journalists um, and human rights defenders who are located in Syria. When we need additional information uh, regarding verification of any of the videos, um, we get in touch with them and they can also help us um, identify a specific place um, or uh, item um, uh, in, the, in the videos. Uh, and the third step that we have for the collection and archival is to um, establish this metadata scheme. Um, and we, for our database, decided to use the metadata uh, scheme developed by the UN Office for High Commissioner of Human Rights. And we did this um, because they are in a, a unique position um, to investigate and also to prosecute. So we felt that if we um, categorize our data by their standards, then it could be useful for future uh, investigations. These are some of the categories that they have uh, in their metadata scheme. And I'm not gonna go over all of them now, but you can just see them, we can come back to them later. The fourth step of the collection and archival uh, is to record as much of the metadata that we uh, can. So we want to contextualize the uh, material that we do have to identify the location, um, the date that it was recorded and uploaded, I can talk about that in a bit, and also the origin of the video, which is a bit harder to um, identify. 
Um, as Heidi mentioned, a lot of the metadata is stripped when it's uploaded into social media platforms. So sometimes there's very little additional information and sometimes there's more. Um, and then step five, once we have identified all of the metadata and an incident, um, we work to collect, store, hash, and timestamp all of the videos that we have um, so that we can preserve the integrity of the videos uh, and make sure that they're not modified after we have downloaded them and stored them securely. So for the verification, we also have five steps. The first step, once we have uh, the video downloaded and stored in our servers, uh, is to parse and to aggregate all the metadata that we have using, as uh, I mentioned, the metadata scheme um, from UNOHCHR, but also uh, additional metadata fields like um, type of munitions used, uh, if that's um, uh, able to be determined, or um, uh, the weather, um, unique landmarks that are in individual videos. Once we have all of that, we can start the verification process. So the second step um, is to verify the source of the video. Um, a lot of the videos that we're getting are sent directly uh, by sources on the ground. Um, so in that case, we, we, know, we know who this is. Um, but when something is uploaded online, uh, we can determine the source by the user account, um, whether it's a media house or whether it's an individual journalist. Um, uh, we, 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 we determine whether they're credible or not based on their history of uploading um, and whether or not um, they're known to us or not. If they're not uh, uh, within our database of credible sources, uh, we have a procedure for verifying them, for vetting them, and I can go into that in a bit. The third step for verification um, is to verify the location. So this is the whole geolocation component. So there's basic ge geolocation that we can determine by uh, reading the, the descriptions of the videos that we've uploaded and also communicating with the people who have uploaded them. In some cases, we also do more in-depth geolocation, um, as Hadi is going to go over in some of the case studies. And then a fourth step is verifying the filming and the upload dates. So upload dates are able to be determined by the date that it has been uploaded to YouTube, but there's tools um, developed by groups like Witness and others that help with this process. Um, sometimes, you know, it may be difficult to verify the date that it was actually filmed. People can film, uh, they can upload it the same day or sometimes many months later. Um, so we have to cross-reference this with a lot of news accounts, reports by NGOs um, or international um, uh, human rights organizations. And then the last step is to publish this into our database. Um, so we make our database publicly available in, open, in an open source format. And this is what the database looks like. So you can see uh, on the left, there's an identifier, there's a description, the date that it was recorded, where it was, and a type of violation um, according to the UNOHCHR standards. So in the red box, you can see the type of violation, and this is using that metadata scheme. Underneath that, um, you can see the types of weapons identified, and then location. And when you click on an individual incident, you can see on the left-hand side, this is where the video is. They don't autoplay because we don't want to expose people to um, content that they might find disturbing. Uh, and if we found that a video um, has, is particularly graphic, we always include a warning um, in a red banner. This one doesn't have it. On the right-hand side, you can see the initial uh, metadata. And then below it, we've geolocated so you can see where each video was actually filmed. On the right-hand side, you can see more additional metadata like the weather or uh, weapons used. So when we look at the videos all together, um, we've developed a map um, where you can, it's interactive, this is just a screenshot, but you can zoom in or out and you can find particular areas um, where particular incidents were filmed. Um, this is all able to be filtered by the type of munition used or the type of investigation that we're doing, for instance, on cluster bombs or chemical weapons. And with that, we've done a number of investigations. Um, so we do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we wanted the archive to be used as an advocacy tool for um, people right now. We wanted to keep people updated in terms of what's the current situation. Uh, we also want to speak directly to policymakers, um, people like the ICC, people like uh, the UNOHCHR um, and others. Um, but also, we recognize that there's a strong um, amount of trust that's needed between us and the people who are uploading the videos. Uh, they, we need to trust them in order to know that the content that they're uh, providing us with is legitimate or if they're uh, vouching for it. 
um, that, that they're making the correct claims, but they also need to trust us that we're using the data um, for the intended purposes. And this is particularly true when they're sending us information directly. So we have an investigations part of the website, as you can see here. Um, and the first one on chemical weapons is a case study that Hadi is going to talk about now. So the first case study is related to <clears throat> the use of uh, chemical weapons in Syria since 2011 until, until now. We have uh, geolocated and verified, collected hundreds of visual evidence related to this. Uh, what we can quickly see from this is first, chemical weapons has been uh, a tool from the beginning of the conflict since 2012. Uh, most of the organizations maybe or uh, human rights uh, community think that it started in 2013 because there is a very big incident there, but it actually started before. We can also see that it's still continuing 2015 and 2016, even after the OPCW, the Organization of Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, have announced that they destroyed chemical uh, weapons in Syria uh, in 2015. Uh, another graph that shows the peak uh, in 2013, uh, most of the video has been published uh, there because there was a big incident in the countryside of Damascus of the use of uh, sarin gas against civilians. Uh, we can see that it's still continuing, not even November, but also until a few days ago. This is one of the recent incidents that happened in eastern Aleppo, which was the use of uh, clarine uh, cylinder uh, against uh, civilians in uh, also civilian areas. Uh, this is the the video that has been uh, published by the Syrian Institute for Justice, which are lawyers that are based in Aleppo. And we can see that they are taking footage of the impact site after the gas cylinder uh, has been dropped. Uh, from this type of images, we try to identify structure of the buildings to be able to understand where this actually happens. Uh, this is the gas cylinder that was used. We, they sent us uh, a very close image to it. Uh, if we go even closer, we can see that there is the sticker from a B, uh, BBC, which is a BCC, which is a Jordanian company that produces uh, chemicals. Uh, we also I, were able to identify the structure of the buildings, uh, as you can see, uh, also the impact sites, as has been seen in the videos, the tree that has been seen also in the video, and through that we go to Google Earth to be able to understand where this actually uh, happened. Uh, in the title, there's a description of where it happened, and we looked around that area. This is exactly where the cameraman is standing. And then by getting uh, a, a better satellite imagery, we can see the same buildings on the right, the impact site, and the tree. Uh, so we know exactly that this is uh, the location in Eastern Aleppo that has been attacked. Um, this is not the only attack uh, that used this kind of gas cylinder, uh, but also there have been uh, earlier ones from Kefir Zeta in Hama, October 2016. Uh, there has been a recent one a few weeks ago in Al-Fardos district in Aleppo, uh, December 8, 2016. Uh, there has been another one a few days ago that happened in Masak in Hanano in Aleppo, December 18, 2016, which all shows uh, a pattern of the use of gas cylinder against civilians, and we can identify that this is one of the tactics that has been used by the Syrian government to take control of, uh, of Aleppo. Uh, all these uh, claimed reports we can uh, are matching with the OPCW. Also, report that has been published in 2015, uh, proving that the Syrian government was responsible for the use of uh, chemicals against uh, civilians. So the second uh, case study is related to uh, cluster munitions use uh, in Syria. Uh, it has been used by the Syrian government and also by the uh, Russian government starting in their operation, uh, September 2015. They deny that they have any kind of uh, weapons like this uh, in Syria. Uh, but there was a, a report that has been published by uh, Russia today, sorry, a video. And this video uh, has been published uh, from Hmaim Air Base, which is the main air base uh, of the Russia aircraft. Uh, and we can identify two types of uh, cluster munitions. One is incendiary RPK 500 Zap 2.5 SM. The other one is more as cluster uh, identified cluster munitions, RPK 500 AO 2.5 RTM. Uh, we, there were also other uh, footage from Himay Air Base that were taken by journalists uh, that were there visiting, uh, and by accident they also uh, photoed this uh, cluster munition that is there. So since then we started to collect and verify 
the visual evidence from media activists that there have been claims that there was a cluster munition uh, has been used. And with Human Rights Watch, uh, in July 2016, uh, we were able to collaborate on a report about cluster munition use in Syria. Um, and through the database, they have identified uh, specific types of cluster munitions, as we can see in this slide and also uh, on this slide. So the third case study is related to geolocating airstrikes, Russian airstrikes, coalition airstrikes. We started with the Russian airstrikes since the beginning of the operation in September uh, 2015. Uh, we have been collecting hundreds and hundreds of also visual evidence related to that. Uh, we try to geolocate as much as possible uh, to understand uh, what happened and where, where was the most attack happened and in which areas. And we did some in-depth also investigations of specific uh, videos. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, it's it was published by the Jusr al-Shuhur Media Center, which is a group that is based in uh, Idlib. And they were claiming that there was uh, a mosque being bombed. It's called Omar ibn al-Khattab. And they were also claiming that it was bombed by a Russian aircraft. So after that, uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense uh, has announced that they are not uh, responsible for this type of attack. Uh, and this is all uh, fake. And they have published uh, satellite imagery uh, of the actual mosque, uh, saying that uh, this is the actual mosque that was reported, uh, and it's still intact, and this is a recent satellite imagery. So what we did is we asked one of the journalists, our sources that uh, we work with from Idlib, to take a photo of this uh, uh, mosque that has been showing on the satellite image. And he did, and it actually was still intact, uh, but the name was Al Farouk, not Farouk, uh, not Omar ibn al Khattab. So we uh, geolocated this one uh, through Google Earth just to understand where it is exactly. And then what we try to do is we try to, do, to, to look for other mosques uh, from close to this area. Uh, and we have found this satellite imagery that was posted on a Facebook page of the Jisr al Shuhur Media Center of a mosque. Uh, that is close to that mosque, but it's still uh, intact uh, because it was months before the attack. Uh, but through the satellite imagery, we were able to geolocate the drone image with the videos that has been published about the attack. This is one of the videos from one of the sources, Hashem Al Abdullah, that we work with him in Idlib. Uh, this is uh, another one from other sources, the Jus al Shuhur Media Center. And from there, we were able to use uh, Google Earth again to geolocate uh, the actual mosque that was attacked. Uh, and then we saw that the distance is about one kilometer between the claimed mosque that was uh, attacked and the actual mosque. And we can see this uh, clearer in uh, this footage from Google Earth right now. So it's about one kilometer away. Um, and we got uh, a clear satellite imagery where uh, after the attack, where we can see that uh, the mosque was, uh, was also attacked. Uh, we have also noticed that the logo of the uh, satellite imagery published by the Russian Ministry of Defense is covering the actual mosque that was attacked. Um, and we don't know if it happened by, by accident or if it's uh, on purpose, but we know that uh, there was a fake information or a wrong information that was published by the Ministry of Defense. Um, so those are a couple of the projects that we were working on in 2016, but for 2017, we have a bunch of plans. Uh, one, we want to add a lot of uh, new sources to the database that we're, um, that we're using. Um, so these are both platform-based. Uh, right now, we're using mostly videos from YouTube, uh, but we also want to incorporate uh, Twitter and Telegram into, into our database, uh, and also from organizations and individuals, like the Violations Documentation Center, who's doing a lot of really amazing work, uh, but we don't have their, their information in our system yet. And also groups like the UN uh, and various, various um, uh, organizations of, that are working on human rights issues that are currently publishing in PDF format. Of course, we also want to be incorporating offline data sources more into the, into the database that we're using. We're looking forward to continuing the open source investigations that we're doing with Bellingcat and with Amnesty International's Digital Verification Corps. Um, and we're looking to develop a toolkit for open source investigations. Open source here meaning um, uh, information that's pub publicly available, 
Um, but the toolkit itself is also going to be open source, um, as in it will be on Git and available for comments. Uh, so if you have any feedback, please let us know. And then lastly, uh, we're looking to develop a platform for collaborative verification of large data sets. Uh, so right now there isn't one. Um, there's gr uh, projects like Check uh, from Meden uh, that are working on verification on individual videos, uh, which is super, super helpful. But for large data set, this doesn't currently exist. Um, so thanks so much for all your time. If you have questions, I know we still have a couple minutes left. Otherwise, we're available afterwards. Uh, and if you have any interest in helping or supporting us, you can check us out. Here's our website. We're on Twitter, and you can email us. That's our PGP key. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions, so please, microphone one. Um, so uh, I want to ask, how could you verify the number of casualty, casualties for um, every crime, and whether if your archive include uh, crimes, less major crimes than the chemical weapons um, that's been used since uh, 2011? Right, so... Um, um we didn't verify the number of casualties as a result of the chemical attacks. Uh, there are other organizations who are doing so, like the Violation Documentation Center. And what we are trying to do is to incorporate what they have data set with the visual evidence so we can understand exactly what happened. Okay, and uh, whether your archive include other crimes that uh, started since 2011 or whether it just uh, includes crimes since 2014? Um, so, we have videos about crimes from 2011 until now. We were not able to process all this information because we're talking about thousands uh, of footage. Uh, but the plan is to go through it for next year. Thank you. Uh, next question, microphone number three. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that you're doing a great job. It's very important that somebody does this, and you know, it's, please keep this up. It's actually two questions. First question is, um, do you have a narrative which brings the facts together in a way, and I'm not talking about a factual narrative, but what the different parties involved in this war are saying and what they're claiming about these events. So it's, we know what happened, but what are they saying about it? Do you have that in your platform? And the second question is, how can we help? I mean, we have a lot of people here in this room who probably want to help, so how can we do that? Right. Uh, so for the first question, we don't have the, the narrative from uh, all the groups that are uh, on the ground. Uh, what we focus on is just con contextualizing the visual evidence and make sure that it has more metadata so it's more understandable and more uh, has a value to be used for uh, advocacy purposes, accountability purposes, and so on. Uh, in terms of the help, I mean, we are here really to, to reach to the hackers community uh, to, and to everyone who is able to help technically and non-technically on this in terms of uh, research, building methodology, uh, technical infrastructure, um, and more. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I mean, a lot of the methods that we're using are, are, are pretty, they're not that difficult. Um, and all of our methodologies are outlined in every report that we're writing. Um, but we're going to be making this toolkit that's available on Git, so if you have any suggestions, like, please help us there, you know, give us some comments, that'd be really helpful. There's also a huge backlog of lots of videos. I mean, if you have time, it would be great to help us with some of those. Thanks. Thank you. I think we have one more time, one time for to squeeze in one more question, but please be precise. Maybe the IRC channel? Well, um, we have questions from IRC. Um, one question is if your work is based on the international human rights definition or if there's a special human rights definition um, made in Syria. I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? One, one user wants yeah. to know if your work is based on the international human rights definition by the UN or um, if your work relies on a special human rights definition defined in Syria. So it's, yeah. it's, uh, we're using the UNHCR categories, which means we are working uh, according to the international humanitarian law, basically. Uh, so some of that is related to also the Syrian uh, code panel, uh, and some of it is not there. 
but the standard is uh, UNOHCHR and the international, international humanitarian law. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.